Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, within the next 20 minutes, I will take you through how to escalate diabetes therapeutics. And during the presentation, I will very briefly touch upon the type 1 diabetes, the pharmacological management, because there aren't much that I can discuss. And I will uh, discuss more in detail the type 2 diabetes and how to approach the individualization of glycemic targets and how, what is the decision cycle for patient-centered glycemic management and the overall approach for glucose lowering in type 2 diabetes. Uh, type 1, the hallmark is absence of insulin or uh, great reduction of insulin. Uh, the insulin deficiency will not only lead to hyperglycemia, but will lead to hypertriglyceridemia, ketoacidosis, and tissue catabolism. The mainstay of treatment is insulin. And the recommendations are that most pe people with type 1 diabetes should be treated with multiple daily injections of prandial and basal or continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion. And the most of the type 1 diabetics should uh, use rapid acting analogs to reduce the uh, risk of hypoglycemia. Those are level A evidence. And the insulin dose is generally calculated based on the body weight. The typical dose ranges from 0.4 to 1 unit per kilogram body weight. And they may need higher doses if the initiation is during puberty, during pregnancy, and when they have intercurrent illnesses. Typically, about 50% of the dose is given as basal, and the rest is divided among meals as prandial insulin. And we should educate the patients on how to adjust prandial doses to account uh, carbohydrate intake, pre-meal glucose, and anticipated activity in order to avoid hypoglycemia. There, are, uh, there is only one another drug which has been approved to use in type 1 uh, diabetics, which is pramlinide. It's an amylene analog. Uh, amylene is a peptide, small peptide co-secreted by the pancreas with uh, insulin. It is found to be associated with the improvement of satiety, inhibition of uh, uh, glucagon secretion, and uh, weight, uh, improvement of weight, therefore, uh, and in, improves the first phase insulin secretion following a meal. Therefore, it is found to be effective in controlling A1C even in type 1 diabetics, and it has found to be improved, improve the uh, body weight. That has been anyway approved to be used among type 1 adults, not for the children. And there are some other drugs that have been studied and are currently under evaluation for the use in type 1 diabetics, some oral agents, including metformin, GLP-1 agonists, and SGLT inhibitors. SGLT-1 and 2 dual inhibitors, sotagliflozin, has been studied uh, because of its uh, beneficial effects on the weight management, uh, benefits on the uh, progression of renal disease and avoidance of hypoglycemia. So if approved, that will be the first oral agent to be used in type 1 diabetes. So when we select the pharmacological treatment for type 2 diabetes, there are various things that we have to think about from the patient's point and about the drug. So the efficacy of the drug is very important and presence of important comorbidities like atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, uh, chronic kidney disease and heart failure, and the risk of hypoglycemia, effect on the body weight, uh, the adverse effects, the cost, and the patient preferences, of course, we have to consider when we select uh, the appropriate agents. This is a very famous picture which shows how to approach and individualize the glycemic targets. The general acceptance is that HbA1c of less than 7% is uh, good for type 1 diabetics, but it is not the same for all. We may individualize the uh, targets depending upon several patient factors. So we may adapt some uh, stringent glycemic targets for some, that means A1C of even less than 6.5% found to be beneficial on some patients. And for some patients, we may not control that tightly and even up to about 8% A1C we may allow for some patients. So what are the deciding factors? The patients who run a very high risk of having hypoglycemia, those who have a very long-standing disease, and when they have a short life expectancy, and when they have important comorbidities and already established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, we may not set very tight targets. We may control their HbA1c up to about 8%. Uh, because our aim is to minimize uh, the symptoms, actually. But for those who are highly motivated, has a 
short duration of disease and uh, uh, who do not have already established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and vascular complications, we may control them uh, with a more stringent glycemic target that is A1C up to about 6.5%. But irrespective of all these conditions, if the patient is highly motivated and has uh, very good adherence to drugs and uh, excellent self-care, then probably we will control them uh, better. That means having the HbA1c targets less than 7%, that is even up to 6.5%. And this is the decision cycle for patient-centered glycemic management in type 2 diabetics. We may have to assess several factors. Our aim, uh, the setting a goal, our aim is to prevent developing complications and optimize quality of life. So how do we set the, uh, how do we decide on uh, what therapy to start on? There are several factors we have to think. We have to assess several uh, patient characteristics like their current lifestyle, uh, the presence or absence of comorbidities, the clinical char characteristics like their age, the current HbA1c, what their weight is, and uh, how motivated the patient is, and whether the, they have depression, and their cultural and socioeconomic context we have to consider. And we have to consider specific factors that impact choice of treatment. Uh, obviously, what the patient's individualized glycemic target is, what HbA1c we expect to, for that patient, and the impact on weight, and the pre uh, risk of hypoglycemia, and what the side effect profile of medication and uh, the complexity of regime, because some patients will not like to go for very frequent dosing intervals, then we may have to control them with uh, once daily or twice daily regimes. And uh, the mode of administration, equally important, some are not, reluct uh, not willing to go for injectables, then we may have to choose the oral medication in order to achieve a good glycemic control. Because uh, all these factors will improve the uh, or adherence and the persistence of the, for the glycemic management. Otherwise, if the patient is not willing and whatever the medication we prescribe, the adherence and the persistence may not be there, then uh, they may not be able to achieve their target. And we have to, not only that, we have to access, uh, assess the availability of the medication, the cost and the accessibility of the patient for the uh, selected agent. And it is not a decision that is taken by the doctor alone. When we make a decision what drugs to choose, we will have to get the patient, the caregivers, and the family members involved in order to uh, have a successful uh, achievement. And we have to empower the patient and ensure the access to diabetes, self-management, education, and support. And how do we set the goal? So we have to have a management plan which has been agreeable for the doctor and the patient both. And we have to, the goals are in short said SMART goals. It stands for specific. And the goals should be specific for each patient. It has to be measurable. For example, if it is HbA1c or fasting and the plasma postprandial glucose, so it has to be a measurable goal. And uh, achievable, it has to be realistic. And we have to give them a time frame to see the improvement. When we implement the management plan, patients not, who do not meet the target, we have to review them quite often. But those who meet goals, we may review them every three months, six months, or even annually. But those who do not meet the goals, we may have to review them uh, more frequently in order to uh, strengthen. Then ongoing monitoring and support, including we have to see whether they are emotional well-being and the ch uh, to check the tolerability of the medication. And we have to monitor the glycemic status, their biofeedbacks, including self-monitoring of blood glucose, what their weight is, and the step count, A1C, blood glucose, and the lipids. All these are parts of glycemic care. And we have to review and agree on a management plan. We, have to, we should avoid clinical inertia. We have to review them often because the drugs that have been initiated at the beginning may not suit, be suitable at the current state. They may develop some side effects and uh, con complications which may uh, allow us to uh, re remove certain drugs from, for example, if a patient develops chronic kidney disease, then we may not be able to continue with the same medications that we have started them initially. So we have to, uh, time to time, we have to review and go through the management plan and with the agreement of the patient, we will have to uh, change or modify the drugs that the patient is on. 
So this is the uh, algorithm and the overall approach for the glycemia. I will take you through from uh, step by step. So the initial uh, glucose lowering medication that we recommend for all is metformin unless contraindicated. That should go in uh, parallel with the uh, com uh, uh, comprehensive uh, lifestyle in modification including the weight management and improving the physical activity. And uh, why metformin? We know that metformin is very effective, safe and inexpensive and there are beneficial effects on the reduction of A1C weight and proven benefits in cardiovascular mortality. Uh, but it is not a very potent drug uh, for the lowering of glucose. Therefore, many will require dual low combination therapy in order to achieve the uh, glycemic targets. But there are some studies which show that metformin use may be associated with vitamin B12 deficiency and worsening of neuropathy. So this is the REACH registry which shows that there is reduction in, significant reduction in all cause mortality in patients who are treated with metformin. So, so this is the diabetes prevention program outcome study which has shown that uh, uh, prolonged use of metformin is associated with vitamin B12 and homocysteine deficiency, low levels of vitamin B12 and homocysteine. Uh, and uh, this is associated with uh, complications like anemia and neuropathy. Therefore, uh, uh, frequent monitoring of uh, B12 levels are uh, recommended. Then what, the, what is next? So deciding the next agent. Uh, uh, there are several factors that we have to consider. The first thing that we are considering when we are going to select the second line agent is whether the patient is having established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease or heart failure. If the patient is having est already established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, then choosing the next agent, our aim is to choose an agent which has shown pro uh, benefit in uh, preventing or preventing progression of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Uh, the next line agents that uh, which have pro uh, shown the benefits in this condition is GLP-1 receptor agonists and the SGLT2 inhibitors. Empagliflozin and uh, canagliflozin has shown cardiovascular benefits and uh, GLP-1 re receptor agonists, liraglutide also has shown and exenatide also has shown uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular benefit when they have already established disease. So, uh, when we have to choose a next agent, if we have not met the HbA1c levels uh, and if it is still about target, then we may have to move on to another agent. If the patient is not on a GLP receptor agonist, then we may use another agent, DPP4 inhibitor, uh, which has proven cardiovascular benefit. And if SGL adding after adding the SGLT, uh, sorry, after adding a DPP4 inhibitor, if the patient has not met the targets, then we may move on to basal insulin, thiazolidin in the on or sulfonylurea. So this is the empiric outcome trial which has shown that uh, in uh, type 2 diabetes who have established cardiovascular disease, treatment with SGLT2 inhibitor empagliflozin has uh, shown a reduction in composite of cardiovascular death, uh, non-fatal myocardial infarction, non-fatal stroke, there's reduction in the risk of cardiovascular death, a reduced risk of hospitalization for heart failure, all-cause mortality, all-cause hospitalization, and reduced risk of incident of worsening nephropathy. So this is the outcome study which has shown that there is uh, a reduction in death from any cause. This study is done in, uh, empaglif uh, with empagliflozin. And uh, if the patient is having predominant heart failure or chronic kidney disease, then what is the next agent that we are going to use? We have to use a SGLT2 inhibitor with evidence of reducing heart failure. If SGLT2s are not tolerated or contraindicated, if the EGFR is less than 45, then uh, the, we cannot use uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, then GLP-1 receptor agonists are a good option.